Turn, please, to Philippians chapter 1. I want to preach and I want to weave in some personal testimony tonight. And I love it that we have all the kids and teens in here tonight. Now, this message I normally preach to teens, so adults, you're welcome to listen as well. Uh, But I want to really encourage the young people to sit up and listen tonight. Uh, I might even walk around a little bit, as long as it won't drive the cameraman crazy, but... uh, um, I, might, I might do a little bit more of a preach if that's okay. All right, so Philippians chapter 1, let's just read one verse, verse 21, and everyone read it out loud with me. Ready? Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, and let's try it together. Ready? For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. One more time. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is is gain. Tonight, I want to look at this subject of what is your life? What what is your life? What's the essence of it? What's the focus of it? What are you all about? Uh, This was, I believe, just the way it's it's such a, a nutshell kind of statement. It stands all by itself. Now, there's a context here, but uh, it's the kind of thing you could consider a slogan. If you're looking for a life verse or a slogan for your life, this would be it. However, I don't think many of us would pick this if we were being very honest. It might be a good verse to to pick as your life verse and say, Lord, make it so. But this was Paul's reality. For me to live is Christ. And to die? Oh, that's gain. You can't threaten me with death. Can't threaten me with heaven. How do you sum up Paul's life? This is it. Now, driving around the country, we see a lot of um, license plates and bumper stickers. And uh, sometimes, just to while away the hours, you're trying to figure out, what does that license plate mean? Uh, uh, It's kind of interesting. See all kinds of bumper stickers. Uh, It's amazing how often you see uh, the coexist. Now, if it has a coexist, you know what I'm talking about hieroglyphics and whatnot, but if it says, if, if there's a coexist one, there's probably 50 other stuff, uh, yeah. uh, bumper stickers all over the place. I don't know what the deal is, but anyway, uh, sometimes you'll see bumper stickers, follow me to such and such Baptist church. I really hope that person goes there and uh, isn't going to the local bar or something like that, but uh, I think it's a great idea, follow me to the church. Um, but you know, Sometimes we get these bumper sticker Christian slogans, um, but this should be more than a bumper sticker. This should be something we strive for and ask God for. Uh, Another idea would be the idea of what you put on a tombstone. And uh, years ago, there's the tombstone pizza commercial. I don't know if you ever remember that. Uh, The slogan was, "What uh, what do you want on your tombstone? Remember that? Okay, no. It was corny, just like the joke. But it is a good question. Not pepperoni, all right? We'll stick with the sausage, maybe, but pepperoni's okay. My kids pick off the pepperoni, you know what I mean? It's just too spicy for them, I don't know. But what would you put on your tombstone if you could choose? Uh, You won't normally have a chance to choose. Someone else will put it there for you. Uh, this would be a, an amazing epith- epitaph, wouldn't it? For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. When I was a kid, I, I was growing up in a godly home. My dad is a pastor. Uh, as was mentioned, he pastored in the Racine County area, a little town called Sturdivant. And that's where I did the bulk of my growing up. So we moved there in 1990, and uh, we were there for about 10 years. So I was five years old. When we arrived, and I was about 16 or so when we left, so that's like your whole world, your growing up years. That's when you're formed. Uh, so I have great memories of that, that church and those, those years. Uh, thank God for the privilege of being born in a Christian family, but you're not born into God's family that way. You gotta come to Jesus on your own. And I thank God that I heard the gospel as a child when I was about four years old, any four-year-olds here tonight? Any four-year-olds? Yeah, I see some 
maybe, okay. When I was about four years old, I heard the gospel. My dad told me the, the gospel, and I remember praying to be saved. I don't remember what he showed me. I don't remember the verses. I just remember praying to be saved, and I remember being very excited about it and jumping into bed. It must have been late at night because I jumped into mom's bed and said, Mom, I got saved. It was great, Uh, and I was so glad to be saved. Uh, By the time I was about seven, I had discovered something. I was a sinner. Now, I'm not sure fully if I understood all about that when I was four or not, But by the time I was seven, I knew I was a sinner. I had told some whoppers. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I I was telling some embarrassingly uh, obvious lies, okay? I was telling lies constantly, and I was hearing good preaching, and all of a sudden it occurred to me, boy, hell is real, and sinners go there, and I sure hope I'm not going there. And I doubted whether I was saved or not. And I remember uh, going to my father in tears, and we went through the gospel again. This time, I think I fully understood what was being said, and I prayed to be saved again. Now, do you need to get saved again if you're already saved? Yes or no? No. Salvation is not something you renew every five years. That's not how it works. But in my case, I was not sure if I was saved. I had doubts, and I'm glad that my father wisely didn't say, no, 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 you're saved. You got saved when you were four. I'm glad he let the Holy Spirit yes. work on me. Yes. And I bowed my head, and I prayed. And I'd... If you ask me, when did you get saved? When you were four or when you were seven? All I can say is I haven't doubted since I was seven years old. Thank God for the reality that he saves and by the way, don't, don't turn away a child who's interested in the gospel. That's right, you know. I'm glad that my dad didn't say, no, 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 wait till you're old and sinful. No, no, no. I'm glad he was willing to take the tender heart of a four-year-old and allow me to trust in Jesus. And God knows, right? right. All I know is when I was seven, I felt like a sinner because I was. By the way, you got to know that you're a sinner to be saved. That's right. And so I was assured of my salvation and uh, going on through my, my, my upbringing in a good church, never missed a Sunday unless I was sick. And though I knew I was going to heaven, I didn't have much spiritual insight or interest. I was really good at falling asleep or not with my eyes open in church. Not that anybody here is good at that, but I was good at that. My eyes were open, but my brain was somewhere else. Until my dad would tell an illustration, because my dad was the preacher, you understand, all right? And so when he would tell an illustration, that was usually going to be either funny or embarrassing. (laughs) Because if it's funny, okay, we laugh. If it's embarrassing, you duck, you know, because it might be about you. Uh, So I'd wake up for the illustration and then phase out. And during those years, I didn't feel anything. I knew I was going to heaven. That was good enough for me. But I didn't feel much conviction about anything else. And a a deadness started creeping into my heart. In my teen years, I began to struggle. And I didn't punk my hair and and, uh, all the stuff. I I was a good Christian kid, but in my heart, I was in trouble. And you know, the lying that I learned how to do when I was seven, I still know how to do that. And now I got good at covering sin. The Bible says that if you cover your sin, you'll not prosper. That's right. But I was learning how to cover sin. I was learning how to cover my tracks. And I, and I had a guilty conscience. And, I, and I, I was miserable. By the way, that's a sign that could be a very clear sign that you're saved. Right. If, you're a, if you're saved and you're sinning, you ought to be miserable because the Holy Spirit inside of you is grieved. And so I knew the Spirit was grieved and I was miserable. And, and as I was getting older, I, I was making the people around me miserable. I remember my younger brother, uh, about almost four years younger than me, we, we couldn't get along. You know, uh, I, I didn't understand it. You know, my two older brothers were older and bigger and stronger than me. And I, I learned that, hey, there's no use in fighting those guys. Just try to tag along and hope they don't kick you out. You know what I mean? So I was happy to just be in their company and, and take orders. But my younger brother, for some reason, didn't want to take orders from me. Now, this isn't fair. I mean, I, I've kind of, I, I've, I've earned my stripes, you know what I mean? And so he didn't see it that way. And so we were button heads constantly. And when you're miserable spiritually, 
you're miserable emotionally, you're miserable in every part of your life, and I developed an anger problem. I was angry generally. And I don't know if it was noticeable to everybody else, but I knew I had it. I didn't know how to shake it. And boy, you know, sometimes little brothers know how to pull it out of you. You know, my, my dad had a favorite chore that he would have us do now and then. He would have us clean out the garage. Oh, cleaning the garage. That was the worst nightmare because we were one of those families. We didn't park in the garage. You know what I mean? We couldn't park in the garage. All right, that was where the stuff went. All important, I'm sure, but that's where all the stuff went. And so when it's time to clean the garage, everything has to be pulled out onto the lawn and wherever you can put it and sweep into the corners. And, and dad would be there to make sure we did it right. And I thank God for a dad who taught us how to work and how to do the job right. So it's me and Daniel. And we are in there working and sweeping and all this. And of course, in my opinion, he's not doing his fair share. You know how that goes. But this was, no, this was no small thing. This is, things have been building. And I don't know what was going on. Words were said back and forth, a push and a shove. And next thing you know, to my shock, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not proud of this, but I put a fist up and I, I leveled him. I had never, I'd punched my brother before. Come on, I'm sorry to say, but we'd beat each other up before. <laughs> but I say this with all seriousness, I'd never tried to kill someone before. Now, I, don't, I didn't realize that's what I was doing, but I put every ounce of everything I had behind that fist, and I knocked him clear skidding across that garage door, and I was about 15 years old, about six feet tall. He was not, and I leveled him, and in my shock, I saw him laying there without a sound. He wasn't breathing. And in an instant, the Holy Spirit said, you just killed him. You're a murderer. Now, he started breathing. And then I was glad he was alive, but then I knew I was dead. You know? <laughs> okay. I was glad he was. I'm not going to. The, okay. You understand what I'm saying? Look, I felt horrible. In that moment, I realized, you know, I'm a lot worse off than I thought. And I'd heard stories of somebody who punched somebody in the solar plexus and stopped someone's heart. And I thought, this could have been that. I could have killed my brother. Now, God, God does different things to show us ourselves. That was one of those moments. And I didn't like what I saw. Well, uh, that summer, I had the chance to work once again, this time legitimately, for uh, the landscaping company, and uh, it was a lot of Christians on the crew. Almost everybody was uh, in the church or uh, a Christian, which was nice. Uh, not everybody. There was one fella, his name was Rob, and he had been hired somewhat recently, and he was a trained, college-educated botanist. He was, he was an expert on shrubs and trees and pruning. He was the real deal. He was not a Christian. He was an atheist. He wanted everybody to know that he was not one of the Christians on the crew. But I have to say, I, I'd never met an atheist before, but he was the nicest atheist I'd ever met. He was a really nice guy. I just had, he was nice, he was funny, he was respectful. He was not gonna use vulgar language around the Christians, but he also let us know, I'm not one of you. And so the boss must have thought he was safe for this green kid to, to work with. And I got assigned to him for most of a summer uh, to do shrub work. And so we went to some really nice clients down by the lake. Uh, one of our clients was actually uh, the owner. It was Mr. Johnson. I forget his first name, but he was the owner of SC Johnson, you know, Glade Air Fresheners, ladies, right? That's it. And of course, the big factory is in Racine. I heard that if that thing ever blows, it'd be like a nuclear explosion going off. I mean, it's, seriously, I mean, it's a very <laughs> touchy situation in that uh, chemical factory. But um, he owned the place, and we, we, we did his lawn. We did his house. It was a palatial mansion, and he had his own private tennis court and with a heated tennis court and all this. And he, he went for the natural gardens feel, which basically looks like weeds, you know, jungle. But anyway, it's the natural gardens 
and there was this little path winding through it, and we had to keep that looking nice. I was told, and this could just be a rumor, but I was told the first day in that job not to say anything too loud in the garden area because he might hear us. And supposedly, supposedly, he liked to hear the nature sounds in the house, so he had microphones all throughout the garden. So don't say anything bad about Mr. Johnson. You know? <laughs> I don't know if that was true, but that's what I was told. And I don't know if it was that house or another one, but I spent a lot of time on, on bushes working on these massive shrubs uh, with Rob. And uh, he, was, he was friendly and he was talkative. He just talked constantly. He was a chatterbox. I learned everything about his life and everything about him. And usually on a big bush, he was on one side of it. I was on the other. We're giving it a, a haircut, basically. All right. We're just, and he insisted on hand shears. Either the, either the two-handed ones or the, just the single-handed hand shears. We were not doing this. Bup, bup, None of that stuff. None of that stuff. We were going in there. And he, on certain bushes, he was very particular that we would, if it was a leafy bush, we weren't going to chop any leaves in half. No, no. Because then it's, it's going to have a nice brown edge, and he didn't like that. He said, you're going to lift that leaf up, and you're going to put a perfect 45-degree angle and cut it just right. That took forever. Of course, you got better at it, but it, it took forever. And so he'd be on one side shaping the bush. I'd be on the other side. We'd be shaping this thing, and he'd be talking his head off. I learned all about his interests. He was, a, he was huge into Halloween. He had invested like twenty dollars or $30,000 into Halloween. He had his own ha haunted house in his barn and all, just crazy stuff. But one day he stopped talking, and it got kind of quiet, and he said... So, Matt, I couldn't see him on the other side of the bush. What about you? What makes you tick? Now, I don't know if I'd ever heard that phrase before. I, I, I kind of probably knew what he was saying, but I didn't answer. I just kind of stood there. And he came around the bush and he said, no, seriously, what, what makes you tick? Now, it's kind of like a, like a pop quiz you're not prepared for, you know. I started sputtering out things like, well, I mean, my brothers and I, we like to play basketball, and um, I, I'm learning to play the trombone, and I really like art. No, 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 not, not that stuff, not that stuff. And he looked me in the eye and said, what drives you when you get up in the morning? What drives you all the way till you get in bed at night? What makes you tick? And he wasn't going to let me away from that. Now I knew what he was talking about, and I knew the answer I should have said. But I delayed. And he's a talker, so he didn't like silence. <laughs> so he said, I'll tell you what makes me tick. Phew, now he's talking. And he started going off about his number one passion in life was the environment. And I found out Rob really loved those bushes. Okay, <laughs> he really loved those bushes. I mean, it was a big deal, climate change and ozone, and he started giving me a full indoctrination on it, what, what made him tick, and the whales and the panda bears. I mean, he, he was a true believer. And then he got to like this feverish pitch of passion, and he said, you know, I'm not lying when I say, if I was on a, on a ship that was going down, and there was no more space on the life raft, and there was a, a, a male and female, the last of the species on the planet, he said, I would gladly let them go on the life raft. I would go down with the ship if, I, if, if that would save that species from extinction. And he was not joking, but I tried not to <laughs> crack a smile. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh my word, he is insane. You know, he's <laughs> truly insane. I think, would you do that for a bug? I mean, what, where, where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? But, but in the midst of all that, the Holy Spirit was working me over. Because he'd asked me, he'd put me on the spot, and I knew what I should have said. You know what I should have said. I was a Christian. I was saved. I had already gone through our church's little soul winning program. I'd learned the Bible verses. Hadn't used it yet, but I, I'd learned the Bible verses about how to share the gospel. I had a little soul winning New Testament. Never used it yet. I had the training. 
I knew this was a golden opportunity to share the gospel. I mean, the, the Philippian jailer kind of moment. Yeah. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, he didn't ask that, but he's asking me. What are you all about? What drives you through the day? And I knew that I needed to say something about Jesus. But I couldn't. Then what's the matter? Did you, did you panic? Well, a little bit. Did you just clam up? Well, it wasn't that. I had been with Rob for weeks. And he might have been an atheist, but he was an honest one. And I could not lie to him. I couldn't fake it. And I knew he'd see through it. And so I deflected and I avoided until he saved the day by rambling about his passions. And I was so convicted as I hear him tell that he will go down with the boat. He would give his life for his cause. I couldn't shake that when I went home. I couldn't shake that for a long time. And in this period of my life, I, I knew I was saved and I, and I, I would hear the preaching and, and the word of God would get through to me and now and then. And I, I remember moments when I'd come forward and, and get something right at the altar and yet I, I was far from God and I knew it. It wasn't real to me. I could not have said, Jesus makes me tick. But I think you know what Paul would have said. He would have said, I'm so glad you asked. For me, life is Christ. And death, that's welcome too, because if I die, I'm with Christ. That's my life. It would have come right off his lips. Was he willing to die for his faith? Yes. <laughs> How many times was he stoned and shipwrecked over and over and over again till the, finally, the, the day came when he did? give his life as a martyr. But he'd already done that. And folks, God began to use things like that in my life, and no doubt my parents praying for each one of us boys and praying for me, and God brought me to a point of desperation where I, I realized I can't keep going on in misery. I'm miserable. I'm miserable to be around. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I'll sit in church, and if I am paying attention, I, I, I was becoming cynical. My own dad's up there preaching, and I, I was mentally fighting what was being said. I remember one time he was preaching on uh, Matthew chapter 11, and I, I love this passage, and I preach it now, but he was preaching Matthew 11, 28 through, 20, uh, 28 through 30. Come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he says this, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And I remember sitting there in a just a foul mood, and I was looking at my dad thinking, that's not true. It's not light. I wished I could have almost yelled out, which I wouldn't have done, <laughs> but I wanted to say, no, it isn't. It's not light. It's impossible. You know, Jesus has a little advantage on being godly, wouldn't you say? I mean, he's God. And I, all my life, I, in my mind, okay, we need to live like Christ. We need to follow Christ. We need to follow his example. That's true. But I figured it out. I can't do that. I'm going to fail. This doesn't work for me. I, I, I can go to the altar 500 million times, and it doesn't change anything. And, and I was cynical, and I was miserable, until finally we were going to go to a conference and hear some preaching, and I was not excited about going because I knew I'd get convicted and beat up by the Holy Spirit. Thank God he does that, right? But I was just looking forward to more failure on the other side. And I remember I cried out to God, tears in my eyes one night. And I said, Lord, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to make something make sense because I can't go on like this. And I don't know what would have happened but God brought me to that point and Galatians 2.20 started opening up to me that week that it's not I, but it's Christ living in me. I began to see there is hope. 
God began to change me and God began to revive me. We're having a revival meeting and I, I just want to tell you, I can personally testify that there is such a thing as revival. God touched me. God revived me. God quickened me. But he did have to bring me to a point where I was looking square into my sin, my weakness, and I was ready to say, God, I can't do this. And I'm not content to be a fake. I knew if I told Rob that Jesus, I knew I was a fake. It wasn't real to me. And I know that there's kids in this room where it's not real yet. God wants it to be. There's adults in this room. And it's not real like it once was. Maybe it's just not real yet. If you're saved... You felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But if your Christian life is marked by misery and frustration, then you, you need what I got. I was already saved, but what I discovered was Jesus is real. This is not about me tagging along trying to imitate Christ, although that would be a worthy goal. But doesn't the world do that? This is about Christ becoming my life. There's a huge difference. He says, for me to live, what's the word? Is Christ. He says, my life is Christ. Now, uh, go to Colossians for a second in your Bible. Let's get back to our scriptures. I love what he says in Colossians chapter three. Colossians chapter three, notice what he says. Same author, Paul speaking. If ye then be risen with Christ. Now pause, that's saying if you're saved. What does it mean to be risen with Christ? See, when you get saved, the old man is put to death and you're raised up a new creature in Christ. It's called regeneration. Yes, someday our bodies will be risen physically, but if you're saved, you've already been spiritually resurrected with Christ. So if you're saved... If you've been risen with Christ, then here, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Just pause for a second. This is so logical. Does it make sense? I've been born from above. When I leave, I'm going up, <laughs> right? So why not live my life pointed that way? Instead of focus down here. It's very simple. It makes sense. And it's the secret to a Christian life that works. A Christian life where, where Christ is everything, where there's joy, where there's victory. Seek those things which are above. You know, in the Bible, you see the term godliness. And what is it? Is that some vague character of religion? No, what does it mean to be godly? Godly just simply means, as far as I can tell, something that points to God. It's amazing how you look outside and all the trees are pointing up. Anybody ever done the experiment with the, with the, the lima beans or the, you put some beans in a plastic bag? We did this with our kids. Put them in a Ziploc bag and with a moist paper towel and we taped it up against the kitchen window. And the sunlight was streaming in every day. And it was fun to watch those little beans sprout and that little kind of weird looking wiggly worm of a, <laughs> of a sprout coming out. And, and so the root found its way down and the sprout found its way up. It's incredible. Now look, every single tree is in a sense godly. It points to its creator. It's pointing up. God wants Christians, everything about their life, to point up. You've been born from above. You're going back there someday. Doesn't it make sense that your life would just point to him? Everything about your life would point to him. The sad reality is those trees are more godly than most Christians. By that simple definition... Because we have the flesh, we have the world, we have pride. It's easy to be caught up in the fog and the chaos and the noise and the clutter of this life. That's not what it's about. It's not about the stuff. It's not about what you can get. 
one of those bumper stickers. You've probably seen it. Uh, the, man with the, the man who dies with the most toys wins. That's not even funny. That's sad. You can't take it with you. Set, verse 2, set your affection on things on earth. That means it's not automatic. It's a choice. Set, place your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. That means God is commanding it, and it's something you can do. You can choose to say, I am not of this world. I'm from that world. I'm going to place my attention there. I'm going to place my eyes there. I'm going to turn my ears toward heaven to hear what God has to say from this book and from the preacher and, and from, from my parents. I'm going to set my affection on things above. That's a choice. And if, you're, if you have the Holy Spirit, he's in there to help you with that. <laughs> right? Because you've been born from above. Verse 3, for ye are dead, and notice, your life is hid with Christ in God. Verse 4, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Folks, this is the key that I began to realize and that gave me hope and brought me to life, revived me, was that Jesus is real and Jesus is not just up there, Jesus is here. And he died for me, and he loves me, and, and he's right here. The Holy Spirit is in me. That began to dawn on me, and boy, that is, that's a life-changing reality. I am dead. Matt Barber died, and I've been raised up. But the life that he's given me is hid in what? In Christ. So that explains our misery. <laughs> if you're not focused on Christ, you don't have a life. You've got misery in this life. Oh, sure, you're eternally secure, but if you choose this world, if you try to find life's joys in anything but Christ, you're going to find death. You're going to find darkness. You're going to have anger. You're going to have all the, the, the encroachments of lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. You're going to be destroyed. And yes, if you're God's child, he will lovingly chasten you. You know, my testimony that I was sharing, that was very gentle, but very effective chastening to, to, to get my attention. And he get, there's much more severe <laughs> levels of chastening. But it's God's love to, to show you that's not where your life is. That's not where your joy is. Your life is hid, but it's not hard to find. Your life is hid where? In Christ. And Christ is in you. Folks, if we would believe that, we would come to life. That's revival. Amen. To be quickened by his word, by his spirit. Not getting saved again, but in a sense, stepping into the reality of what he gave you when you got saved. That's what it is. It's a choice to set your affections there. It's a choice to believe, to actually choose to believe that he can satisfy, that he is enough. I'll tell you what, God began to change my life, and it was God doing it. God began to give me a different perspective towards my brother. I began to love him. I, I, I would have said I loved him. You always say you love your brother, you love your sister, whatever. But I began to love him. I began to pray for him. I began to realize, you know, I have a responsibility to help him, to lead him by example. God began to shift my perspective. I began to realize, you know, I don't always have to be the big guy in charge. I can let him win. That's hard, okay? <laughs> That's hard to let your little brother win. But you know what? I can let him win. It's okay. I don't have to, I don't have to win this battle. And God was, God was rewiring my brain through Christ. Because Christ does not think like me. And I don't naturally think like him. But God was starting to rewire my mind through his word. And I'd, I'd been given a, a, a brand new Schofield Bible. You mentioned the Schofield Bible. It's not this one right now because it's kind of worn out, but I, I still have it. And I began to devour this book. I mean, devour it. Uh, people binge watch their TV shows. Bad idea. Ever tried binge reading the Bible? Now, it wasn't something I was told to do. I couldn't put it down. 
I was 16 years old and I was reading and underlining and, and the book of Galatians just came alive because that's where Galatians 2.20 is, right? So the whole book began to open up to me and I was underlining. I had this orange highlighter and underlining, underlining. Un I go back to that now and I laugh because it's all orange. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> hey, it's all good. Amen. It's all good. But it's not good when you're dead. I was not dead eternally. I was saved, but I was living in practical death because I was not finding my joy in Christ. I was in the fog of self and sin and guilt, and I hadn't discovered that I can have life in Christ. Boy, once you tap into that, you cannot put this book down. And when you've been too far, too long away from it, you hunger for it. You thirst for it. Because that's your life. Now, folks, young and old, I don't care what your background is, Jesus is your life. And you don't have to wait till you're 16. You can be five or six or 10 and have revival this week. You could have just been saved last year and you can have revival. What's sad is there's folks who've been saved for decades, long time. But if they were put on the spot, by their neighbor. So what makes you tick? What are you all about? You might have to think about it. You might have that awkward moment when you say, I don't know what I should, I know what I should say, but I don't know what I can say. And this could explain our lack of witness. This could explain why we just kind of put our heads down and just talk to Christians. Thank God for Christian friends. Maybe that's why we can't make the difference. Oh, folks, let me ask you this question. Is Christ your life? What is your life? Who is your life? Is it Jesus? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Lord, we ask that you would quicken us by thy word. I can't take any credit for what you did in my life. You were doing it, and I thank you for that. You're still doing it. And Lord, there's young people, there's adults here today, if they're honest, you're not really what their life is all about but you want to be. Lord, for some, I pray that you'd just wake them up so they start to hunger again. They start to thirst and desire it again. Lord, for some, maybe you already touched something in their heart. If they were asked that question, oh, something would come to mind, but it's not Christ, it's something else. Their life is about something else. Oh, Lord, would you expose those idols tonight? Would you prick our hearts? Lord, there may be someone who's never been born again. They don't know what this is all about. They, they know about Jesus. They know about religion. They know about church, but they don't have a relationship with Christ. They don't have any assurance of heaven. Lord, if there's someone who needs to be saved, would you do that tonight? We pray that you do all that's in your heart. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Pastor.